All right, I reckon we might be good to go now. Hopefully everybody is in and they're ready to join us for a really great session. Um, hi everyone, my name is Sharon Mackay. I look after our third party distribution here at Fisher Funds. Today, I'm really delighted to say that we have Sam and Robbie, two of our senior portfolio managers joining us today. Sam covers New Zealand shares, property and infrastructure in his portfolio, and Robbie covers Australian shares. So between them, I think we've got some really great coverage to cover any questions that you may have. Over the next 30 or 40 minutes, both Sam and Robbie will share their views on what's happening in the market with a particular focus on their portfolios. But if you do have other questions, please pop them into, into the channel and we can answer them as we go. Um, as I mentioned, we are coming to you today from our homes in Auckland. So, you know, personally, I'm really hoping that the internet connection holds out. And I'm really, really hoping that my negotiation skills with my husband worked out and he manages to keep the excited puppy that joined our house a few months ago out of mischief. And there is no surprise appearance in the webinar. We really want to make sure you get the most out of today's session. So please, you will see a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can ask any questions. We'll do our very best to answer them as we go. If there's anything specific you'd like us to come back to you on, please just pop in your email address and one of our team will come back to you. Uh, just before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. This webinar is recorded. It will be available to all of you after. So if you do have to leave or you feel that you missed something, don't panic, you can actually pick it up in the recording webinar later. Uh, your attendance isn't visible to anyone else, so don't be worried if you are sitting there in your PJs, no one else can tell. Uh, the webinar today is general information only, so it is not financial advice and it doesn't take into account your specific situation. We do have a great team of financial advisors here at Fisher Funds and a fantastic team of independent advisors that can help you. If you do want to contact us, just do that through our webpage or drop us an email and we can get you in contact with the right people. Right, I hope you're settled in and you're ready to get going. We're just about to start the Q&A with Sam and Robbie. So uh, Robbie, I'm going to start with you first. So quick question for you just to kick us off today. Talking on our Australian portfolio companies, what trends are they seeing and how are you faring in this, this disrupted environment with New Zealand uh, still in lockdown, New South Wales and Victoria coming out? Oh, thank you, Sharon, and, and good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome. It's, it's great to, to be with you today. Um, yeah, it's a good question, Sharon, and, and there are, I guess, we've in, in catching up with our companies, we are seeing a number of trends um, that, that have been playing out. I guess the first thing I'd point out is um, one feature that has been consistent across um, our portfolio, our Aussie portfolio, um, over the last couple of years is that our companies have been navigating this ever-changing environment extremely well. Um, you know, our, our investment process is focused on, on finding high-quality businesses that typically produce um, goods and services that people need in one form or another, whether it's the plasma products that are used to treat hemophilia that CSL produces, whether it's software that is used by WiseTech, for example, to, um, to, to service logistics companies and help get, get goods from um, across the world to New Zealand and, and back again. Um, it, it helps when you are making goods and services that people need. And so that helps, um, I guess, them be pretty resilient through what is a very volatile environment. Uh, our, fo our investment focus is also on, on companies that are run by, by people that are pretty astute. So we, we do focus on, on, on the quality of the people running the businesses. And that's also um, stood us in good stead over the last, the last couple of years. Um, but one trend that we are seeing um, that, that, that is coming through quite forcefully is, uh, is that our, our companies in the technology space um, are, are typically doing um, really well. You know, the world has been digitizing some companies have been going from working in the physical environment uh, to the online environment and COVID has obviously accelerated that and we are seeing um, our software um, our, our software companies like WiseTech, um, which, which as, as I said, services the logistics industry are, are doing really well in that environment. Um, the usage of their, of their core products has really skyrocketed in the last couple of years um, and they've won a whole no, you know, a number of new contracts as a consequence of that. Um, we have companies like uh, Next DC, which is a, a data, uh, one of the premier data center operators in Australia. Again, as companies are, are, are moving their storage and data from um, be, being housed physically on site into the cloud and into 
onto the internet, um, that they've been a beneficiary of that trend. And again, we've seen an acceleration of that uh, over the course of the, the, the last couple of years. Um, so that's one trend. Um, a second trend that we're seeing is, um, you know, companies involved with takeaways are doing really well. I mean, it's a very basic concept, but I think we can all, all relate to that, um, both during lockdown and as we've come out of lockdown. Uh, and in Australia, we, you know, we're invested in Domino's Pizza. And they have um, uh, a range of pizza chains in New Zealand, Australia, France, Germany, um, a few other European countries, as well as Japan. And they've done exceptionally well in this environment. Um, it helps that their business model, in their business model, they control distribution and the delivery of pizza. And so when we've gone into lockdown, that's helped them really tighten up and make sure that they can deliver pizza in a safe, COVID-friendly fashion. Uh, and they've really benefited strongly from that. Um, so that's another trend. It, it hasn't all been plain sailing though. Um, you know, our, our listeners and, and viewers might, might have heard a lot about supply chain disruptions. Um, and we've certainly seen that affect our portfolio companies as well. Um, you know, two in particular that I'll call out, um, one is ResMed, which uh, has, has actually been a COVID beneficiary because it makes ventilators and um, products that, that, that help people with, um, with, with dis, I guess, disrupted breathing disorders. Um, but, that, but their production and their revenue growth rate has slowed down because um, of components shortages um, that, that feed into, into the manufacturing of their products. Um, Ordinate, which is a, a business that we have um, and the portfolio that uh, makes products that go into audio equipment, microphones, mixers, speakers, and so on. Uh, they've last week came out and, and they've just downgraded downgraded their revenue growth rate because again they've had chip or component shortages out of Asia that has meant that they they can't supply and meet the demand um, that's growing incidentally growing very strongly for their product so so that's one negative feature hopefully that proves to be transitory and you know they're working hard to resolve those those supply chain challenges. Okay hey, that's great Robbie thank you so much for that what we might do now is Sam just pass over to you but I think you know what Robbie's touched on is there seems to be sort of microchip sh shortages of it and I think we've also heard that in the news as well so we're hearing about shortages across the globe but definitely hearing about microchip is this the tip of the iceberg and can you tell us about some of the other shortages that we're seeing globally and, and is this going to impact Christmas long term? Yeah, most important question last there <laughs> yeah thanks Sharon <laughs> And good afternoon, everyone. And, and Robbie, I think I have personally um, bolstered the revenues of um, your Domino's pizza position over this lockdown myself and my my son. So um, I hope you're appreciative of that. Um, Very order a few more, Sam. We always do with more, more pizzas being ordered. <laughs> We're doing our best. Um, yeah, that is right, though, Sharon. We are seeing many, many severe demand supply imbalances globally. So that's either too much demand not enough supply or more likely both. So whether it be the microchips that Robbie mentioned, um, we're seeing you know, things like at European natural gas prices are up two to 300% in the last year. IT workers are extremely hard to hire. So too much demand, not enough supply of those. Um, shipping freight rates, we've all heard about this. They've more than quadrupled this year alone. And even the availability of speedboats here in New Zealand, there's some really extreme demand supply imbalances right now. And on that last one, on speedboats, I don't think there has been a time in history whereby anyone who was delivered a new speedboat three to six months ago has already made 20% on their investment. Bearing in mind, speedboats are in theory one of the most sharply depreciating assets on earth. So crazy times, crazy imbalances. Why is this? And there's lots of idiosyncrasies in each of those supply chains that Robbie referred to, for example, but the, the overriding three reasons are firstly, there's just too much money chasing too few goods and services. So Recall Dave McLeish and the fixed income team before has spoken about unprecedented global central bank liquidity and extremely low interest rates stoking that too much money chasing too few goods and services. Secondly, surging demand. So countries are coming out of lockdown. They're going from virtually no demand at all to surging demand. And supply chains are just not built to take these kind of surges. And the third overriding reason for this is because we've been seeing these shortages for six or 12 months, I'm sure everyone's got a story about this. You, know, you can't get cedar for 12 months, for example. Businesses do not want to get caught short, particularly into Christmas, Sharon, and are ordering double or triple what they really need. So those three factors are really feeding on each other, and we've, it's created the perfect storm globally. You know what, you might have hit the nail on the head there, because I feel like every time I order something online, I order double. Just in case. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing, isn't it? You, you're going to order double, and then at some stage you're going to realize you can get that product and you're going to order nothing. And Absolutely. that's what I'm talking about, these, these surges, right? It's very, very powerful. 
<laughs> awesome, thanks for that, Sam. Hey, Robbie, just coming back to you, you did mention Ordinate, and apart from supply chain issues, this is an innovative company. How important is innovation and research in the development of your investing process? Yeah, Sharon, it's actually it's it's a it's a critical part of our investment process. Um, you know, our, our our viewers might know that we we have the steep process, and um, as, as part you know, as part of, of, of that acronym, the, the second E stands for earnings forecast or earnings growth rates. And so we are focused on companies that, that do benefit from really strong earnings growth into the future. And one indicator of whether a company can grow um, is, is how much they are spending in innovation and research and development today. Um, it doesn't guarantee success. I might add, and people can spend a lot of money spinning their wheels researching stuff that doesn't work. Um, but it is a good indicator of whether a company is putting itself in a position to grow. And we find, um, particularly in our healthcare and our, our tech investments, that these businesses are investing a lot in innovation and, and research and development. I mean, our tech businesses, the likes of WiseTech that I referenced, um, Ordinate, um, Zero is another one. They spend over 30% of their revenues each year in, our, in research and development, which is laying the groundwork for that growth pipeline into the future. Um, our healthcare businesses um, do likewise. They, they don't quite spend 30%, but they, they certainly spend about eight to 10% of revenues um, sort of uniformly on research and development. I mean, CSL, which I mentioned, it's, I mean, this is a large plasma products company. Um, it's, you know, it's 130 billion market cap. It's a very large business. And in the last 12 months, they've spent over a billion US dollars in developing new products that hopefully will, will solve um, you know, healthcare conditions into the future. So it, it is factored in uh, very closely as part of um, our assessment of that E2 score when it comes to, 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 to the steep process. That's awesome. Thanks very much for that, Robbie. But we are getting some really amazing questions coming through. So we're going to flip over and start to answer some of those questions. Uh, Sam, you did touch on one of them. So just a little bit of a, a further one on that one. Uh, inflation seems to be on everybody's uh, mind at the moment, and it certainly is, again, a, a topic of conversation. I'd like to say around the dinner table, but uh, not in our house. Uh, so how, do, how will inflation start affecting investments and how does it change you know, how we should be helping people think about uh, making gains in this kind of inflationary environment? What do you do to protect yourself? So on inflation, you're right, Sharon, everyone's talking about it globally. We, we know the print here in New Zealand recently, the most recent CPI print, 4.9% was the highest in 16 years. We know the US and European inflation prints or CPI numbers that have been released are the highest in 13 years. So it's a big deal. Everyone's talking about it. <clears throat> I do think that those comments I made before feed into it. So, you know, the, those high labor costs, you can't get IT people, for example, um, Robbie's chip shortage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shipping quadrupling, natural gas tripling, um, oil's up 100%. These all, these all feed into it. And one thing you didn't ask me before, Sharon, I'm pleased about that was, when will this all stop? And we do think it, um, at Fisher Funds, this is going to be transitory. What I would say is those three big drivers I was talking about before, so too much money chasing too few goods, uh, a surging demand and uh, I can't actually remember the third one I, I talked about, but uh, they all it takes is one or two of those just to change slightly, like the, the slope of the demand to change slightly. Um, and as Murphy's law always has it, these things always often change at the same time. So here in New Zealand, we're seeing interest rates start to go up. So the, the central banks are starting to take the punch bowl away a little bit. Um, you know, the LA ports, for example, we've seen an incredible bottleneck there. And we're starting to see that ease, for example. We're starting to see freight rates start to come down globally. But the final point I'll make on all of this is Robbie and I are not economists, um, unashamedly so. So we're really focused on these, these companies that Robbie started to talk about before. And the most important thing to have for a company in an inflationary environment is pricing power. So the ability to pass on these abnormal cost, cost rises um, to your customers. And the, the main way you can do that is by having a wide moat around your business, which is clearly our business model. That's what we're looking for. And a great example of that is someone like Zero. Um, Robbie touched on them. Um, customers love the product. They've got a huge lead on their competitors. Uh, the surveys we've done is if, if Zero raised prices 20 to 30%, would you walk away from the product? And the answer is no, because we love the product. So that's what pricing power is all about. Mm. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Sam. Uh, Robbie, this one might be for you. Uh, we're just thinking, have a couple, a couple of questions coming in around diversification across 
the portfolio. So when you're thinking about, I guess, companies coming into a portfolio or the weighting of companies within a portfolio, how do you approach diversification and how do you factor in that consideration to taking that long-term view of how you want the portfolio position to deliver outcomes for customers? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. It's, um, you know, at, at Fisher Funds, we are active managers. And so we are unashamedly uh, going after the, the very best companies that we can find in the across the investment universe that we invest in. So um, we, we, we very definitely try and concentrate our investments in our best ideas. And so relative to many fund managers and passive managers globally, we have quite concentrated portfolios, i.e. we've got fewer positions in them. So we just take those very um, best handpicked companies in our uh, investment universes and put them into the portfolio. So for example, in Australia, we've only got 25 companies in our Australian portfolios. Um, but there is very definitely um, a, a balance there that is required because you never know what's going to come, come at you from a market's perspective. So you need to have some balance so that your, the portfolio's performance is not dependent on any one specific set of circumstances to play out in order for the portfolio to do well. And if I can just highlight, just delve into, for example, in the Aussie equity portfolios, um, one sector in particular, you know, we, we've got a number of investments in the healthcare sector in Australia, um, but not all healthcare companies have had the same fortunes through, through this COVID experience. So, um, you know, if I think we've got roughly four companies that we're invested in, in healthcare in Australia, two of them have done really well through COVID. ResMed, which I alluded to earlier, that is now facing some supply chain disruptions, has been a COVID beneficiary because their ventilators have become the standard, um, you know, part of the standard of care of treating people with COVID. So their share price is up a lot over the course of the last 18 months. Sonic Healthcare is another one that's done well. Um, you know, that, that business actually processes COVID tests. So you can imagine that they've done really well through that and their share price is up quite strongly. But we've had CSL that I mentioned earlier, um, which has, has had a really tough time in the last 18 months because they found it difficult to collect plasma from donors because people have been um, reticent to go out and, and donate blood. So that's been a tough, um, a, a tough backdrop for them to operate from and their growth has been impeded. Um, Nanosonics is another one. They provide disinfectant solutions to, um, to hospitals. And um, again, hospitals have restricted access to people um, outside of critical care during the, the, the course of COVID. Uh, and with that, their sales rates have dropped off. In both cases, with CSL and Nanosonics, we're seeing that turn around as the global economy opens up. Um, but it, I guess it speaks to the importance, just within healthcare, of having some blend of companies because their fortunes will differ. Um, so it's it's a little bit like the Goldilocks story. You need some diversification so that it's not it's not too concentrated or too diverse, so that you you can you diversify all away all of the good returns, um, but you do need some concentration so that you can really benefit from those best ideas. And so we're always weighing up the, that balance and making sure that we uh, that we create some balance so our portfolios aren't dependent on one set of, of specific economic circumstances to do well. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Robbie. Um, uh, apologies to everybody that's listening into the webinar. Unfortunately, we did lose the questions that you had posted up earlier. And we had a wee kind of technical fault there. So we kind of are a little bit back to, to basis. If you could pop through your questions again, that'll be really brilliant. We have got a couple more coming through. So I'll just start on those now. But any questions, please just pop them through it again. That'd be fantastic. And thanks again for your patience. Uh, you know, Sam, I feel like this might be one for you. And it's one that comes up a lot. And it's one that I don't know is going to stop being a bit of a theme in people's minds for quite some time. Cryptocurrency. <laughs> How do we feel about cryptocurrency? What do we think about it? And do we really see that it has a possible future in portfolios at some point in time? Yeah, well, I, I personally feel a little bit jealous that I didn't buy some at $1,000 on, on the Bitcoin, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, look, fr from, a, um, from a portfolio investment point of view, I think we look for three things in an investment. Um, so first of all, you look for um, its utility. So a lot of the the bulls around crypto will say that it's a great medium of exchange. Um, the reason we have an issue with that is if you think about the, the requirements for a medium of exchange is you, you want that medium of exchange, that currency to be fairly stable and cryptocurrency also Bitcoin, I should use Bitcoin as an example, is 11 times as volatile as global currency. So, you know, a few months back, Bitcoin fell 30% in a night. 
And if you think about that, and if you were saving up your Bitcoins to go on holiday once this lockdown finally opens up, you'd be going on a, a less desirable holiday overnight than you were previously thinking. So we don't think it passes the, um, the medium of exchange test. The second thing is it offers some sort of return. So like a property will offer income, um, <clears throat> shares will offer intrinsic value via future cash flows that are accruing to shareholders. And Bitcoin really is a bit of the beauties in the eye of the beholder. Um, it's kind of a greater full theory. So we're not sure what, what return it offers. Um, and the final thing is we, we would look for in a potential um, diversified portfolio investment is protection. So we love bonds because they give us protection. So they typically go up in price when equities are going down in price, a great hedge, a great protection. Um, or we like inflation hedges like um, inflation linked bonds, for example. So they'll give us protection when inflation's going up for our overall portfolio or our clients' portfolios. Originally, the people said that Bitcoin would be a good inflation hedge because it's finite. I think there's 21 million coins that can be can be mined in total. The problem with that is there's now 4,900 cryptocurrencies, so this is, it's it's infinite. And what we've actually found is um, when markets are correcting hard, Bitcoin goes down faster, so there's no protection from equity market corrections. And secondly, they've given limited inflation protection so far. So it doesn't pass those three tests. Again, I'm a bit jealous. I didn't buy some with my personal money, but it would have been just a punt because it doesn't pass those three tests. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Sam. One of the questions that has come in, and it is a question that we get quite often, is we spend a lot of time as individuals getting ready to accumulate. So we are investing and saving our money to get ready for the day that we can actually finally either start to scale back work activity or retire in full. Uh, one of the questions that often comes to people's mind is, you know, how do I structure my portfolio to, to really take account of the fact that in retirement, I'll have, you know, hopefully anywhere between 20 to 30 years and I've got to make my money last over that time, as well as I'm not earning anymore, so I can't really afford to take too much downside risk. Um, so I'll take on board this question. If you guys want to pitch in or you do have anything that you want to add, please feel free as well. It'll, the, the reality at the end of the day is quite often as we get ready and start to think about changing our earnings potential, so coming into retirement, generally we should be thinking about dialing back some of our exposure to riskier assets. Uh, what I would say, and coming back to this isn't financial advice, and we do think that this is one topic that it is really important to get financial advice on, you know, you, you really kind of, you're balancing out when you think you might need to use money and how tolerant or how you can position yourself for market corrections or volatility short term. So as I said, often in retirement, we still have quite a long term to make our money last. We're just not earning any more on the side of it. So we really have to balance out making sure that we don't take on too much risk so we get a downside fright when markets do correct, but also we don't overexpose ourselves to not taking on board enough risk so we end up having, I guess, that detrimental impact that inflation erodes our purchasing power over time. So as I said, this isn't financial advice, it is just a general commentary around how to start to think about these things. I would recommend people get advice. It is a really useful, useful conversation to have with a financial advisor. Okay, just thinking about a couple of other questions now that are, are coming through. Uh, Robbie, have you got any comment on the collapse of the Chinese housing market and the impact that may have on the Australian economy in particular, given, I guess, uh, well, not so much these days, but definitely there is a bit of a reliance, particularly on Australia, of the Chinese economy? Yeah, it's... Um... Uh, you know, certainly the, the there is an impact. Um, what happens in China certainly does translate into Australia because China is, um, you know, Australia's biggest trading partner. In terms of property, to the extent that the um, that the property market slows down because of uh, what we've seen with with Evergrande, which is a very big property developer um, that has run into um, some troubles. Uh, the, the direct translation really affects um, Australia from the perspective of, of the commodities part of, of the economy. Um, so Australia, you know, its two biggest exports to, to China are coal and, um, and iron ore, and the iron ore feeds into steel production, um, a large portion of which is used in property. So to the extent that the property market slows down, that will have a, a negative impact, um, I guess, on the iron ore um, and potentially the coal market as well. With iron ore, we've already seen that translate. So we've seen the iron ore price, you know, reach a peak of over 200 and 25 US dollars a ton uh, earlier this year, and that's fallen sharply back to about $115 um, today. 
and so that, that that does impact the 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 commodity producers and we've seen the material sector in australia sell off quite a lot um our portfolios our australian portfolios though are not very exposed to the commodities sector directly um we do have a a position in, in rio tinto in our portfolios uh, but by and large the commodities um producers uh do do, do not um are, are not great fits for our investment style so so we've seen a far lo lower impact um I, I guess across our our specific Specific portfolios because of that. Um, on the whole, though, I think the Australian economy will 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 hold up okay. Um, you know, they're still shipping a lot of iron ore to to um, to China, even if uh, the pricing at which they're shipping that iron ore um, is quite a bit lower than it was back in in May and June. Wonderful. Thanks very much for that, Robbie. Look, I'm going to give you a little break. I was going to put, keep you in the hot seat, but I'm going to head back to Sam for this next question. Sam, are there any companies in particular that are catching your eye when you're really thinking about kind of what comes into the portfolio next? Um, so there's lots of, I guess, focus on, uh, I guess, sustainable and renewable energy forms. How does that factor for New Zealand? But also wondering if you could also give us a bit of line of sight into what we might be thinking globally as well. Yeah, I always think that's the, the absolute best question to answer, but it's the one I'm least likely to give you an answer to. <laughs> now, look, in New Zealand, um, it's pretty easy. So, well, sorry, I wouldn't say it's easy. Nothing's easy, but it's a much smaller universe. So we are constantly turning over our entire universe in New Zealand, and our entire universe is all listed companies in New Zealand. So at any one point in time, we've got sort of 20 companies bubbling away. But the, the trick is given we're fairly fully invested and we don't hold a lot of cash, as you know, as, an, as clients, uh, we have to sell something that's in our existing portfolio to replace it to, with one of these 20 companies that's bubbling away in the background. And we're constantly making that trade off and that, that decision. Um, and it's tough because, um, you know, we hope that we and the, and the people before us have done a good job of combing that New Zealand market. So we're hoping we, we genuinely have, have the best companies in there. Um, but if you sort of think back, um, some of those companies that have come into the portfolio, companies like Zero, companies like Pushpay, et cetera, whereby we have sold down some of our existing crop of high quality assets. Um, if you look globally uh, and actually kind of dovetailing into your renewables comment, Sharon, um, we do really admire companies like Infratil who are chasing um, you know, secular thematics or mega themes. So for example, Infratool chases, um, chases is probably the wrong word, invests alongside or behind um, obvious mega thematics like data proliferation. So they have made that bet via their CDC investment in Australia, which has been phenomenal for them, which is, you know, a, a Canberra data centers or a data center. Um, they've also just recently made a data center investment in the UK and right back here in New Zealand as an access point for that data proliferation, they've invested behind Vodafone. So in the property and infrastructure portfolio, we are investing alongside those thematics as well. So the cellular towers we invest in, um, American Tower and Crown Castle, absolutely dovetail into that um, data proliferation mega thematic. And it's a long way of me not giving you the next portfolio <laughs> company we're about to invest in, um, but uh, it's a good question. Brilliant, thanks so much for that. Hey Robbie, we'll just hand back to you. I know one of the things that you're super passionate about is ESG, environmental, social and governance factors and how they influence decision making. So not just in your portfolios, but I think you're wearing that hat for the whole investment team around how we shape up our approach to thinking about environment, social and governance factors with any security that we have in a portfolio. So just wonder if you can give us a, a little bit of insight into how we think about that within our business and how we're positioning for the future around that. Yeah, well, Sharon, um, our ears, you know, we've, we have been at Fisher Funds applying um, an ESG lens or an environmental, social and governance lens to our investment process for, for many years now. Um, it, it's governed by um, an ESG committee of which I, I, I sit on that committee um, uh, along with uh, one or two other members from the investment team. And we also have um, members across the firm uh, you know, in, in other divisions, Bruce McLaughlin, our CEO sits in that committee um, and some client facing uh, team members also sit in the committee so that we get a holistic approach to ESG issues how our clients are thinking about them, how they, um, how our ESG policies, uh, I guess, are, are framed up in the context of values that are important to us as well as our, our clients. And that ESG committee formulates the, the, 
I guess, the key parts of our policy. Um, th and there are a number of strands to it. The first strand is we do have an exclusions list and exclusions policy. So that's a hard um, go, no go kind of line that we have for companies that, that don't meet certain thresholds. So for example, we exclude companies that um, produce thermal coal. Um, so all companies that, that, that produce meaningful amounts of thermal coal are, are excluded from our um, from our portfolios. We exclude companies that manufacture various um, uh, arms, you know, cluster munitions, nuclear weapons, and so on, which are, are very detrimental to society. Um, and we exclude um, companies involved in the gaming industry because from a social perspective, uh, we, we think that um, th there's not much upside to, to having those, those sorts of businesses operating. So we have an exclusions list and, and that governs what, what is excluded out of the portfolio. Uh, but we also have, um, you know, uh, as an active manager, because we speak to our companies and we know our company management teams quite well, um, engagement forms a very core part of the way that we, we use ESG in our investment process. So we will pick up the phone, we'll speak to our companies if something, uh, you know, controversy arises um, in relation to a company. Uh, we will share our view of what we think companies could do to improve their E, you know, the ESG standing. Uh, we will vote our shares at an AGM if we um, disagree with the direction that a company is going in. And, and finally, um, through engagement, if we make no progress, which is which is often quite what rare, I might add, um, we will eventually divest the companies, um, you know, on ESG grounds. So we applied. I guess it's it's part and parcel of the way that we we conduct our, our investment um, process. What I would say is because we have this ESG lens. Uh, on one hand, and we have this um, uh, this investment process that is focused on finding high quality growing businesses, we tend to find very few, relatively speaking, very few ESG issues within the universe that we would naturally gravitate to. You know, I spoke about earlier about the fact that we are typically investing in businesses that provides goods and services that benefit society and are there to help people. Um, those tend not to be the companies where you find large ESG issues. So I, I guess the ESG policy coupled with our investment process means that we do screen out a lot of companies that would, would otherwise uh, trip investors up from an ESG perspective. Hey, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Robbie. Look, I think we probably have just one final question and I'm going to get you guys to actually take a back seat on this one so you can kind of just, you know, relax a little bit and take a bit of a breath. The question that is almost related to the to a little one that we had before. So the question that's often coming up these days is now a good time to invest. So there has been market volatility. And again, if you guys want to jump in, please feel free to. So does it mean that I should not do it now? Should I wait for things to come around and settle down? Or you know, what should I do? So the, the concern around this tends to be, uh, when is a good time to invest? Um, so my view is it's always a good time to invest. So anytime that there is volatility, there are also opportunities. So it really is being geared up and prepared to manage your way through that. It doesn't matter if volatility starts at the beginning or the middle or the end of your journey, it, it will be there in some shape guise or fashion at any time during your investing lifespan. Uh, my, my advice to people is get advice. <laughs> it sounds really simple and, and a little bit silly, but take the time to find a financial advisor, sit down with them. They will help you set out what is right for you and figure out the best way of structuring your investments to make sure that they manage risk but they also manage the reward that you'll get for investing as well. So um, if anyone that is thinking about is now the right time to invest, sit down and have a chat with someone. As we mentioned earlier, we do have a team of advisors internally to Fisher Fund, and we also work with a great team of independent financial advisors. So if you are looking for some help, if you want to just sit down and have a conversation and understand a little more, uh, drop us a note, get in touch, and we'll get you in front of the right people. Um, I feel like that might be pretty much the end of our session today. Look, I did want to say thank you so much for persevering with our technical hitch up there as well. You know, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit of a long uh, stretch while we were scrambling around trying to get everything back and running again. It's been really great uh, being able to share our time with you today. We've had some brilliant questions. Uh, if you do have anything that you're still looking for answers to, drop us a note and feel free to get in touch at any time. Thanks again very much. And to Robbie and Sam, thank you so much for sharing your time today as well. As always, you guys have been brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks very much. Bye.